Hello, everyone. I hope you're all healthy, happy, and well. Welcome to the next talk in our Golden Webinars in Astrophysics series. Our speaker today is Marcelo Gleiser, who is the Appleton Professor of Natural Philosophy and a Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. My name is Thomas Puzia, and together with Paula Ranko, we have organized today's webinar for you. As in our previous webinars, simultaneous language interpretation is provided by Mr. Patricio Gonzalez, who is and will be simultaneously translating for us into Spanish. En sus dispositivos, pueden escuchar la interpretación al español de la conferencia al pinchar el botón de interpretación que se encuentra en el parte inferior derecha de la ventana de la aplicación Zoom y seleccionar español. We would like to acknowledge the generous support of the Center for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA for its Spanish acronym, for making this series possible. Before we begin, we would like to say a few words given the recent events in our Golden Webinar series. When we created the Golden Webinars in Astrophysics series, our objective was to create a platform to provide unfiltered and free access to scientific topics and discussions in astronomy, astrophysics, and other related fields to a broad international audience. This was meant to counter the pandemic situation in a productive and positive way and bring minds together to allow the flow of knowledge despite the lockdown restraints. We believe that science is a human endeavor and that scientific progress is inherently based on the debate of arguments. Scientific arguments are made on the basis of theoretical reasoning and or observations, and the validity of hypotheses are evaluated and scrutinized against empirical data. A healthy debate and exchange of ideas is fundamental to the progress of science, even if this leads to controversy. Every hypothesis, as unusual and unlikely it may seem, needs to be discussed and evaluated, and its validity evaluated with scientific rigor based on quantifiable metrics and probability assessments. Our philosophy at the Golden Webinars of Astrophysics in Astrophysics series is that during such debates, every participant must treat each, each other with respect, dignity, and kindness, regardless of whether they agree with each other or not. We will not tolerate any other behavior. We believe that what brings us all together is our common appreciation for science and knowledge and we would like to take particularly this opportunity to thank everyone for your support. The audience, the panel members, the speakers, the viewers on social media. This would not be possible without you and your continued support. For us, the Golden Webinar Series has been a labor of our profound appreciation for science and knowledge. The whole team has volunteered hundreds of hours of work in many ways, taking on multiple roles and going out of our comfort zone. This work, this has been a wonderful project and a beautiful learning experience for us all. Our commitment to everyone is to continue to provide this platform for the sharing, the appreciation and the creation of knowledge in a respectful and productive manner to everyone, uh, free of charge for as long as we can and with the hopes of making this series a sustainable, a self-sustainable project in the near future. So thank you so much for your feedback and comments. So if you are watching a recording of this talk on YouTube, please leave your comments below. If you would like to support the Golden Webinar series or give us feedback, please send us an email. If you have any questions during the talk, please type them in the Q&A window. You can also upvote questions and comments on them. We will select the best questions for the discussion after the talk. The link to the live video, the link, uh, sorry, the link to the live version of this video will be automatically taken down by YouTube shortly after the stream ends. However, the final uh, high resolution version, both in English and also in Spanish, will be uploaded for in our channel in the next few weeks. So we, before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce our other panel members that are with us today. So of course, we have the speaker, Marcelo Glazer, Patricio Gonzalez as our interpreter as usual, and Thomas and I as co-hosts. And from the Institute of Astrophysics at PUC, we have our postdocs, Elizabeth Arthur de la Ville de and Demetra de Chico. We've also the great pleasure to welcome our guest panelists that are with us today. Margot Brower, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Kaptein Astronomical Institute in Groningen and at the Institute for Theoretical Physics in Amsterdam. Marina Trevisan, who is a professor of astronomy at the Department of Astronomy at the Universidad Federal de Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Luz Angel 
Angela Garcia, Professor of Astrophysics at the University ECCI in Bogota in Colombia. Nosan Janowski, who is a professor in the Department of Computer and Information Science at Brooklyn College at the Graduate Center of the University of the City University of New York. Paul Honigan Hühner, a professor of philosophy at the Institute of Philosophy at the Leibniz University of Hanover in Germany, and lecturer at the Department of Economics at the University of Zurich. And Julio Navarro, who is the Lansdowne Professor of Science at the University of Victoria in Canada. And last but not least, we have our fantastic Q&A manager, Ricardo Acevedo, who will be managing the comments and questions for us in the background. So it is now our great pleasure to introduce Marcelo Gleiser as our golden webinar speaker today. Marcelo got his PhD degree in theoretical physics from the University of London King's College in July 1986. After he obtained postdoctoral fellows at the Fermilab Theoretical Astrophysics Group and at the Institute for Theoretical Physics in the University of California in Santa Barbara. In 1991, he became assistant professor of physics and astronomy at Dartmouth College then associate and finally full professor in 1998. He's also the director of the Cross-Disciplinary Engagement Institute at Dartmouth since 2016. During his career, Marcelo received many awards, such, such as the Presidential Faculty Fellow Award from the White House in 1994, the Jabuti Award in three opportunities, which is the highest literary award given in Brazil for non-fiction books, and to Dr. Honoris Causa, in 2019, he was awarded the Templeton Prize Laureate, received for the first time by a Latin American, an honor that he shares with scientists like Freeman Dyson and Martin Rees. His research topics include the interface of particle physics and cosmology, in particular the dynamics of primordial phase transitions, and also a statistical field theory applied to the early universe. Also known perturbative aspects of field theories and the emergence of complex collective behavior in stochastic field theories. In 1994, he co-discovered oscillons, which are long-lived small energy lamps made of many particles. But more recently, he has turned his attention to the origin of life on Earth, becoming an influential voice in the growing astrobiology community. Marcelo wrote several books that have been published in 15 languages, including The Island of Knowledge, The Limits of Science and the Search for Meaning, a Tear at the Edge of Creation, and The Simple Beauty of the Unexpected. He has also published hundreds of peer-reviewed articles and more than a thousand essays and op-eds, and frequently participates in TV documentaries and radio shows in the US and also abroad. He is also a fellow of the American Physical Society, a professor extraordinarius at the University of South Africa, and a member of the Brazilian Academy of Philosophy. So we now hand it over to Marcelo, who will tell us about the island of knowledge, the limits of science and the search for meaning. So Marcelo, whenever you want. Okay, so first of all, hi everyone, wherever you are. Um, I am delighted and honored to have been invited to this. Thomas and Paula, thank you so much for hosting, for taking care of me, for being, um, for being very clear in your instructions. And so if there are any confusions that they're all my fault, not theirs. So let's start from that. Um, and I'm also um, sorry I missed the conversation about extraterrestrial life that happened some time ago because obviously that is something that I am very, very interested in. Um, but today I will talk mostly about science and from a philosophical perspective, perhaps it was very hard between Thomas and I, we shared many emails deciding what I was going to talk about because there are different choices. And I thought that given the nature of the seminar and the fact that it's somewhat open to the general public, we decided to go with something which is a little less technical than a normal technical seminar would be like, but not less provoking and hopefully inspiring to most of you. And our negotiation is that I am supposed to give a, a technical talk in March, I think sometime, I forgot exactly when but it's part of a more. So today, no formulas, just ideas and pretty much a meditation on how science works and what we can say about what we can say about the world and what are the limits of knowledge. With that, let me uh, share my screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation. 
So as you can see, the title of this talk um, is The Island of Knowledge. And, and then I have a subtitle, which is not something that you talk about very often in science, right? In science, we, we don't really talk very often about meaning or certainly not about our search for meaning, right? And the hour here is not just our scientists, but is really our human beings. And, and one of the points that I want to make clear in, my, in, in this presentation is that science is very much part of our general culture. And it contributes in very fundamental ways to our worldviews, to the way we think about reality, to the way we think about the world in which we exist, and to the way we think about ourselves and how we relate to life and to other parts of the material, the material node, other parts of the non-living reality that we live in. So there is a huge component to what we're going to say, which is really to contextualize science as part of a much older um, uh, quest for understanding of our nature, of us humans in a very complex and very vast, now we know, universe. That's why you have in this first um, uh, slide here, you have a superposition of some very iconic uh, uh, religious symbols, right? So you have Stonehenge, um, which is a, a Neolithic a monument that uh, from, from Southern England, which we now understand to be uh, very much an astronomical observatory that people use to time, for example, summer solstices and things like that. And you have the Maori natives of New Zealand uh, and you have some Egyptian allegory uh, uh, mentioned here. And of course, in the Sistine Chapel, the notion of God giving life to Adam, like Michelangelo presented it, which is a very Christian, very Western way of thinking about the religious creation of life from a monotheistic perspective. And then here, of course, you have the remains of a, of, a, of a supernova red giant where inside, in the middle of all this, there is a, a white dwarf star, the remains of what was once a bigger star, um, which is in a sense, what's gonna to happen to our sun in about 5 billion years from now. And you have the Hubble Space Telescope on the bottom right, just to remind us that our expansion of our understanding of reality depends very much on how and what we can see of this reality. Right. So I'd like to 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 start by um, framing the conversation, following some quotes by people that inspire us all the time, just not just as scientists, but as humans. So here we go. So this is a quote from Einstein, who says that what I see in nature is a magnificent structure that we can comprehend only very imperfectly and that must fill a thinking person with a feeling of humility. Now, that quote is a very important quote and it's not a quote from Einstein that you hear very often, right? Um, the quotes from Einstein that you hear often are like, you know, God doesn't play dice when he's relating to his puzzlement with quantum physics where he just cannot believe that the fundamental nature of reality is actually probabilistic and not deterministic. So Einstein, had a worldview where he believed in the rationality of the universe, that the universe was fundamentally rational, intelligible, even though he was somewhat amazed by the fact that we humans can actually make sense of reality, right? One of the most unintelligible and amazing things about the universe is that we can make sense of so much of it. But he also was humble enough to recognize that the picture that we create through science, what we can call more broadly, the scientific narrative is necessarily incomplete or imperfect. And that is a very important point. And it is essentially the crux of what I wanna talk about today. What is that it is imperfect or incomplete about science? And what does that mean for us scientists and for the people, uh, for the general public that want to understand how science works and what it's able and not able to tell us about reality. And most importantly, he says that the grandiosity of nature, 
this is implicity here, is such that us humans, given the fact that we are fallible and we are limited, can only see part of the picture, right? And because of that, any thinking person that is a person that is reflecting about who we are in, the, in, in, in front of, of nature, in front of this vast unknown that uh, we deal with, should have a feeling of humility, right? And unfortunately, that feeling of humility is often forgotten in academia and outside of academia, right? The idea that if you become an expert on something and you know answers for, for the questions within your field, you sort of forget that you don't know answers in so many other fields and you become somewhat arrogant without really any particular reason to be so, right? And so it's a good reminder from the master himself for us to always keep an open mind and a sense of humility when we're facing questions which are very deep and very complicated, such as, as we'll see today, the question of the nature of reality itself, which is a very, very big question indeed, right? And how much can we actually understand and think about it? To complement this one, I have another one from him, which is someone more well known, which is the fact that he says, the fairest thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and science. He who does not know it and can no longer wonder is as good as dead. And he goes on to say, it's like a snuffed out candle. That is a candle that has been snuffed out. that doesn't burn anymore, right? And I love this quote because I like a lot the word mysterious, right? Because you can think of it in many different ways, but we have to remember something very fundamental about science. Every scientific endeavor and exploration starts with a question, starts with something we don't know about the world. It starts with ignorance. So the fundamental propelling driving force behind any scientific project is ignorance, right? We want to know, and I'll explore this a little more in detail later. So when Einstein here mentions the mysterious, that is what he means, right? There is this sense that there is so much about nature, about the world that we, not, we do not comprehend. And there is this idea of the mystery as a fundamental emotion, which is actually a driver for our creativity. And this is really interesting that he groups art and science in the same cradle, right? The sense that the human creativity that is focused in the arts or in the sciences is really just one thing, human creativity. It's an effort that we have to try to make sense of who we are, right? And of course, the methodology, the way we frame questions in the sciences and in the arts, it's very different. But what he's getting at here is at the human spirit behind these questions, right? The idea that why is it that you spend 40, 50 years of your life asking questions about the property of materials or about the possibility that neutron stars can have some interesting new states of matter in there, in the core, like strange uh, quarks, or what is the nature of dark energy and dark matter, which I'll talk about later on today. So there is a reason why people are doing that. You are engaging with this mystery that is outside of our sphere of perception. And that's why I love this picture of the fish right? You have this goldfish here in this aquarium, right? And people have usually two kinds of reactions to this picture. One of them is poor fish, right? I mean, the fish is right next to the ocean. Let's assume that this is a fish that can actually survive in salt water for now. So this fish is right next to the ocean. It knows through the glass, it can see through the glass that there is all this water out there to be explored but it is confined within the glass bowl, right? And unless the tide goes up and it can jump out, it is stuck in that prison knowing 
that there is this reality out there, which is so tantalizingly close, but yet unreachable, or only reachable within a certain level, right? So that's one reaction. Like we feel sorry for the fish. And the reason why we feel sorry for the fish is because I'm, of course, the photographer. I am the person who has the freedom to be out there in the world taking pictures, putting the fishbowl in there to create this image, right? And I am free. I perceive reality in much more complete ways than this fish would. And because of that, I'm a superior creature that have this perception of the world, which is so amazing. And the point is that actually, if you start thinking about this picture, we are also the fish. We are a different kind of fish. We can see perhaps a little more of reality than the fish. We can create conjectures about reality that this fish has no idea what to do, but we're still the fish because as we are going to argue in some detail today, what we see of the world is necessarily limited for two fundamental reasons. The first one, the first one is that the one of the fundamental premises of science, as we understand it now, is the separation between what is observed and the observer, right? When you step out into outside your house, right? You see cars and you see trees and you see people. They are not you. They are outside of you. There is some sort of objectivity that you can bring to your vision of reality where you can say, this is the world because I can see things, I can hear things, I can touch things, I can sense things. So you have your five, five senses, right? And because of that, what's going on is that your brain is capturing information from these five senses, integrating this information and creating what you would call my sense of reality. Yeah, I know the world because after all, I can see things, I can hear things. And so this is the world. Well, it turns out that one of the things that science has taught us over the last at least 400 years is that what we see of the world is a very small fraction of what's really out there, right? One of the things that science does is to provide windows into aspects of reality that you do not perceive simply because your senses did not evolve in this planet to see things like ultraviolet or infrared radiation or neutrinos coming from the sun or cosmic rays, etc. So one of the things that science is doing is amplifying our view of reality. And the instruments that we use to do that is what I call reality amplifiers. And they tell a story and you could tell a whole history of science all the way from the beginning, way before Galileo. You can start in Babylonia, even with the ancient Greeks for sure, where what we see and how we quantify reality is fundamentally dependent on the way we look at the world and the way we look at the world is fundamentally dependent on the technologies that we have to explore the world, right? So when we talk about worldviews, we're talking about worldviews that are changing in time, right? And the way worldviews change in time is very much driven by two things that Thomas mentioned in the beginning, which is the fact that we create hypotheses, right? We have a daring brain that wants to Educate, create educated guesses of what's out there in the world based on a feedback that comes from what information we can collect from the world. So this idea of empirical uh, validation, right? The fact that we observe things, that we measure things. But this process of exploration, of observing things and measuring things is very contingent on how we humans operate physiologically. And how our instruments expand our views, but always within limitations. So because of that, I want to give you a sense that what we call reality, at least in a very naive sense, 
is really not reality at all, right? Reality is a much grander, much vaster entity, if you want to use that word, than we could ever dream to capture, even though we have capturing so much more of it over the years, right? So what the fish thinks is reality is completely different from what we think is reality. It's completely different from what a human being or an ancestor that lived in the 18th century thought was reality or someone at the time of Galileo and certainly someone at the time of say the Egyptians, right? The, the Egyptian empire. So the world hasn't changed. The universe hasn't changed that much in that time. Of course, everything is in flux as Heraclitus always says, but the way we look at things and the way we make sense of things is always changing. So that's why it's important to think of science as a self-correcting ongoing narrative. So with that in mind, I want to bring together two more quotes, which I think are extremely important. So we talked about Einstein, and now I'm going to go to Heisenberg, right? One of the architects of quantum physics. And he says something which is very much to the point, which is this, that what we observe is not nature itself, but it's nature exposed to our method of questioning. So what, what he was driving at here is essentially, you know, in the foundations of quantum physics, one of the things that people realize, and it was a big drama, big, a real big drama, the first three decades of the 20th century when these people were trying to figure out the rules of the atomic world and of the worlds of subatomic particles. There was a lot of drama, a lot of confusion, but one of the things that became clear, which was a direct punch into this notion of our separation, our notion of objectivity, is that the separation between observer and what's being observed is really not as sharp as we would like it to be, or as we think it is in the world of our everyday lives. So when we ask a question to nature, we are asking a question to nature, which is very much dependent on the context of which tools do we have to ask that question? How can we bring funds to build that particular tool and not another tool? So the questions we're asking are questions which are not completely overarching. They are questions that depend on a social context, depend on a cultural context, that depend on an economic context, right? So obviously scientists, they always want more and more money to build better and better machines. You know, if you go to the Atacama Desert, you see spectacular telescopes up there because we want to extend our reach into the universe so that we can see more and more, right? And comprehend more and more of the things that are out there so that we can look back and understand better who we are. Because in the very, there is a sense in which every question we ask about something else is really a question that we're asking about ourselves, right? But the way we are asking these questions, they are not absolute. <clears throat> they are not godlike. In philosophy, there is something that this uh, a philosopher from uh, NYU called Thomas Nagel said, you know, the gods, the, the idea of God's view. So the God's view is a metaphor for the perfect view, the view that is all encompassing, that is perfectly objective. And the point is that the more we understand the universe, the more we understand science, the more we understand our own cognitive be behavior, the more we understand that these views are not godlike at all. They are human views. Our science is a human science. And, and of course, there are some things that we can say about the world that possibly, possibly, and this is a very interesting topic for perhaps our Q&A later on. I would love to hear what some of the panelists and the public thinks about this, that other intelligences, if they exist, I am a big skeptic of a plurality of intelligences across the universe. I think we live in a very rare planet indeed. Uh, we can also talk about that later, but still, considering the possibility of other intelligences, what kind of science would they develop? Would it be the same kind of science that we develop? Would they be asking the same questions that we develop? Well, 
Not necessarily, because if we have learned something from the history of life on our planet, is that the history of life on a planet is very much contingent on the planet's life history, which basically means the following, that life evolves in a very tightly coupled interaction with the environment in which it evolves. So had Earth had a different kind of history, just to be kind of like give an example, which is very popular, if the asteroid that hit the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago had not hit the Earth, the dinosaurs would not have been extinct the way they were extinct. The history of life on this planet would have been completely different and we wouldn't be here. So this idea of contingency in the history of a planet and the way evolution and natural selection shapes fundamentally the life forms that exist tells you that different places will have different histories, will have different life forms, will have intelligence that we absolutely have no idea about. And these intelligence will probably ask questions which will be very different from ours unless there are some universal questions that will be repeated. And that is a fascinating question, right? I mean, will mathematics be the same everywhere, right? Is the number pi something that everyone that develops mathematics will discover, right? So, but this is, but the point that I want to make here for now, I don't want to go on this tangent yet, is that we have to focus the way we understand the world through the way we understand the world. We here as the royal he, we humans. And there is a philosopher from France from the 17th century, whom I love, called uh, Bernard Louis de Fontenelle, that says, that says that, first of all, it was a book that he wrote in 1686, same year that Newton published his Principia, where he speculates on the possibility of intelligent life in other worlds. It's a wonderful thing. You should take a look at it. And in this book is a conversation between the philosopher, the natural philosopher, and a marquise, a woman, which is a very important thing. There were no protagonist women in many books in the 17th century. So de Fontenelle put her there and she asks him, what is philosophy? And he answers in the following way. All philosophy is based on two things only, curiosity and poor eyesight. And I absolutely love this quote because that is exactly what it is, right? We humans and in everything that we do, we want to know more, but we are short-sighted, right? I mean, we can't, see everything that we would like to see. And from this drive to know, and from the limits of what we can know, there is a tension. And this tension is what drives our creativity, but also the tension that reminds us that, remember that we are the ones asking questions about nature, and also that those questions are necessarily not going to be all conclusive and final because our story is changing as we see better the world. And these sorts of questions um, have been with us for a very long time. So in this volume seven of the Republic, Plato came up with this very famous thing called the allegory of the cave. And in the allegory of the cave, Plato basically is trying to show that to people do not trust your senses. Your senses are misleading. And so what he has is he has a bunch of slaves right, that's his allegory, uh, ch uh, chained in such a way that they can only look forward to the wall in front of them, which is the wall of the cave. And what they see on that wall is projected images that move about. So to them, and they cannot move, move sideways, they cannot look sideways, they, they were chained this way since they were born. This is a thought experiment. And they do not know that behind them, there is a bunch of people with all statues and stuff and a roaring fire projecting those images onto the wall. So to them, what they see of reality, the shadows on the wall is all there is of reality because the way they look at reality is limited. If you had a bigger view of the world, you would know about the people behind you. And that is exactly our predicament as humans, right? There is a bigger world out there, a bigger view out there, but we see 
the shadows on the wall, right? And this is a funny one because if you remember the movie, The Matrix, Neo is, you know, Keanu Reeves, right? And so now is Neo there visiting Plato's wall, uh, Plato's cave, and here are the slaves, right? And he's obviously Neo. And here is something which I would say it's kind of like a unicorn doing what animals usually do, even magical ones, apparently. And, and behind that, you have some very naughty looking person, which nobody knows exactly who the people were cast in the shadows. Some people say they were the poets that Plato did not like poets, you know, because they create lies with their words. And Plato was all about truth and finality and completion of knowledge. So he says, do not believe the shadows on the wall. Do not believe your senses. All knowledge has to come from the mind only. So if you want perfect knowledge, you go to the mind. And what it says here is, you know, one guy, one of the says, it's prophesied that one day a chosen one among us will break free of this world and reveal to us the true nature of reality, which is sort of like the dream, right, of the physicist. What is the ontological structure of reality, right? What is behind everything that is? And Neo here is like, I don't think so, right? And that's the idea. So, um, of course, my this was supposed to be the introduction to my talk, which already lasted about half an hour. So, um, and given that the fact that this is really about, well, supposedly is an astrophysics um, seminar, I will focus mostly on the first two parts here, the cosmic and the material. The three realities here is not to say that these are the only realities at all, they're not. These are just illustrations of how the limits of knowledge come to play in different, um, in different uh, areas of knowledge, right? So cosmic mean cosmological, astronomical, material, cognitive, I think I can, they're self-explanatory. So first thing is, as I mentioned before, the way we look at the world changes, right? And the way we look at the world changes and our narrative of what the world is like is also changing. So if you ask someone in uh, 1500, so the year Pedro Alvarez Cabral, Portuguese explorer arrived in Brazil, 1500. If you ask Pedro Alvarez Cabral, which world do you live in? He would say, I live in an earth-centered world, right? And the earth is at the center of everything. And the planets and the moon and the stars, they all go around it, carried by, 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 by uh, crystal spheres, right? And this is the world that is reproduced in Dante's um, Divine Comedy, is the world that carries true, you know, from the Greeks all the way to the 16th, 17th century when Copernicus and Galileo and company come in. This world is completely different from the world somebody from the 18th century would um, describe, which is a world where the sun is now the center, right? And in the 18th century, telescopes are becoming big enough for people to look at nebula, etc. So what changed it was our ability to describe reality in different ways because we have tools they are better and better. So if you now ask us, okay, uh, which world do we live in, right? We say, well, we live in an expanding universe populated by at least 200 billion galaxies. These galaxies can be far away from one another by millions and millions of light years. Each galaxy can have from hundreds of millions to hundreds of billions or more stars. Most of these stars we know now have planets. Many of these planets have moons. So if you look at our, our, our galaxy, the Milky Way, which would be say a spiral galaxy kind of like this one. Um, I don't have to tell you that we cannot take a picture of the Milky Way because as you found out, I'm sure you know, we can go to Mars and take pictures of Mars. Beautiful thing that happened yesterday with perseverance, um, but we cannot step out of the Milky Way and take a selfie with the Milky Way behind us. So this is a Hubble Space Telescope deep field picture where you see a bunch of galaxies. So our Milky Way would be something that would look like this with about 200 billion stars and a giant black hole in the middle. So we have learned tremendous things about the universe, right? Because our tools of exploration have evolved, right? So the history of astronomy before 
Galileo pointed the telescope in 1609 to the sky and after changed completely. And the important thing to remember, it changed because once you have a new tool of exploration, you're able to ask questions that you just couldn't even dream of before. So the advancement of knowledge comes very much driven by this idea that once we have the right tools, they are fundamental tools, they are very revolutionary tools of observation. In the same century in 1674, I think the microscope was invented in Holland as well, both the telescope and the microscope, uh, because they're great lens makers there at the time. And that changed the way we thought about life. And CRISPR and modern technologies now are changing the world, the way we think about the genetic makeup of life and how much we can uh, interfere with that. So the way we look at things is very much contingent on what we can see of the things. And of course, the hypothesis that we can make about the things that we cannot see so that we can go and test them with new tools, right? So it is very much part of science, not just look at things, but ask questions, potential questions about can this exist or not exist and then go out there and try to see what happens with that. So that's very important. On the material side of things, um, we have advanced tremendously. So this is a picture by Hambra. And if you know Hambra, usually he paints very sad looking people, right? But here you have a picture of Hambra. This is actually a self-portrait. And it's a self-portrait of Hambra in the image of Democritus. Now, who is Democritus, right? Democritus is this pre-Socratic pre philosopher, so ancient Greece, about 400 BC, who together with Leucippus put forward the notion of everything is made of little in, indivisible things called atoms. And he was called the laughing philosopher because he thought that reason was the path to freedom, that the ability to think critically about the nature of the world freed people from superstition and from the fear of the supernatural. And so he propagated this notion that the more you acquire a knowledge of the world, the freer you are as an individual. And because of that, you become a happier person and not a scared person. And so in this picture, you have Democritus laughing over there. And indeed, you know, a lot has happened since ancient Greece about uh, the nature of matter. And we know, for example, about atoms and, and we can now probe the, the properties of matter to within a nuclear particle. So we know that protons and neutrons are not fundamentals. We have something called the standard model of particle physics, which kind of puts together everything that we have seen and measured in the laboratory about particles. And it's a beautiful achievement, no question about it, right? In the same way that what we have done with astronomy and with general relativity is a beautiful achievement. And because they're beautiful achievements, this is a very important point, they open a bunch of not a new questions that we do not know the answers to, right? It is an interesting thing that has happened in the history of science that quite often very eminent scientists said, you know what, we're done. Everything now is just a little detail for us to figure out. Very famously, Lord Kelvin, you know, who formulated the second law of thermodynamics and a bunch of other very, very important things in the 19th century, very early in the 20th century said, yep, we know mechanics, we know thermodynamics, we know electromagnetism, we're kind of done, right? And then boom, came relativity, the special and the general theory of relativity, came quantum physics, and we realize we're not even close to being done. And the more we discover new things, the more new questions we have to ask. Point here, given that we are talking about astrophysics, the material composition of the universe is an enormous mystery nowadays. So everything that we see, those pictures like this, right? Those things that shine and we can take pictures and measure both visible and invisible radiation, they compose about 5% of what's out there, which we can call it visible matter. We know there's two other kinds, you know, dark matter and dark energy. 
right? Now, dark matter was something that was conjectured to exist in the 1930s already by uh, Swiss American physicist, uh, astronomer called Fritz uh, Zwicky. And he sort of realized that galaxies, when there were many, many of them close to each other in a cluster, they were moving at speeds which were much larger than they should be moving. And he conjectured that the reason for that is that there was all this matter that does not shine, right? And dark matter. And as time evolved, you know, people thought of many different possible things that dark matter could be, right? From an elementary particle that has nothing to do with electrons or quarks, so completely different, doesn't interact via electricity. The only way it interacts with ordinary matter, the stuff that shines, is through gravity. And because of that, we know it's there. And because of that, we know how much of it it's there. And it's about five times more than the matter that shines. The only reason we know these things is because now we have the tools of exploration to make these precise measurements. And in fact, in 1998, another giant surprise came up with the discovery of the rest of this equation, 68% of dark energy, which is something that we really do not know what it is at all, right? As we do not know what dark matter is at all, we have a bunch of theories. The most popular one is pretty much crumbling down, which is the idea that this this dark matter is made of particles coming from a symmetry of nature called supersymmetry. Um, I have been, uh, I've done like, a lot of work on this in my, the early stages of my career, and I am very, very skeptical that that's the way it's going to go. In fact, I have a big, a big, uh, very expensive ball of whiskey bet with a famous supersymmetry guy called Gordon Kane that you guys are not going to find supersymmetry at the Large Hadron Collider, and this is really not happening. Sorry, folks. Um, but the point is that we do not know what dark matter is. It could be oscillons. It could be you know, blobs of stuff that we don't know, a possibly different kind of field of nature, and the same with dark energy. Dark energy, we have a couple of ideas, of course, about what it could be, but we really do not know. We just know that there is this thing that permeates the whole of the universe which has this very strange effect of pushing the fabric of space apart. Like think of space as a big rubber band and what dark energy is doing is like it's pushing things apart and galaxies are being pushed apart with this accelerated expansion. And so it's something that can do that to space, um, but we do not know exactly what it is. There are a couple of conjectures out there. doesn't matter at this point what they are. But the point is that this was discovered by two groups of astronomers because they had the right tools to look at a kind of supernova called type 1a and show that those things explode the real bang so light, so strong, so bright that you can actually map them in faraway galaxies to show that they were blowing up in galaxies that were moving away from us faster than we had expected them to. So this is beautiful, right? Because this is exactly how science should work, not thinking that we're going to get to the end of the story, but knowing they're always somewhat in the middle of the story because the story grows. And um, yeah, this is a quote from Democritus. In reality, we know nothing, for truth is in the depths. I love that. And then I would go on and on about cognitive science, but I won't because I'm running out of time. I just want to get to which is too bad, maybe another day, Thomas, I'll come back and do this. It's a whole other talk here, but I want to just go back to this notion of how you can picture, at least the way I picture, uh, the evolution of knowledge. So if you think of knowledge, and knowledge here, you can focus on science, but not necessarily only. Any kind of thing that we're creating as humans fits in an island, and this island is clearly growing in time, right? And as any good island, this island is also surrounded by an ocean, right? In this case, I would call it the ocean of the unknown, right? The island of knowledge has the ocean of the unknown. The unknown stuff that we still don't know about the nature of reality. And you'd say, well, there are two fundamental positions here. One is to say that, hey, it's just a matter of time. I'm like Plato. There is a final truth about reality. And if we push hard enough, we'll get to it. And this island is going to cover the whole ocean of unknown. And we're going to get to the final theory of everything. 
and there'll be very, very few new questions to ask, kind of like Lord Kelvin, right? So that's one position. I would argue, however, that it is the completely wrong position, right? That so in in what's in the game here? In the game is this notion that is a very old notion in philosophy called the fight between being and becoming. Being the notion that there is a final truth about everything that is immutable and it's out there just like Plato thinking it's in thought, right? In the realm of, of ideas, the realm of forms in, his th in philosophy. And then you have the philosophy of becoming the notion that everything is in a state of flux, more like the Her Heraclitus and, and, and that really you can not get to the end of anything that the idea being here that as the island grows, so grows the boundaries between what is known and what is unknown. And these boundaries between what is known and what is unknown is where we are asking new questions about reality that we couldn't have done before, like with the telescope, like with the microscope, like with genome sequencing, right? And so well, like with the information revolution we're living in, now everything is information. My whole research now is about what is the information in complex things in the universe. And that is the kind of stuff that in the beginning of my career, I wouldn't be asking because in the last 30 years, information became such an explosive idea that we are couching our questions in accordance to that. So the narrative changes that way. So you have the known and you have the oceans of the unknown. And in there, in the oceans of the unknown, there are also regions which I would call the unknowable. They are very, basic questions you can ask scientific or otherwise, but let's stick with science now about reality that just simply cannot be answered within science. I'll give, since this is an astrophysics talk, I'll give a very simple example. Um, we know the universe is about 14 billion years old. That means that since the time of the Big Bang, light could only travel a certain distance which is not 14 billion light years because light actually takes a hike with the expanding space and it can cover a much bigger distance than 14 billion light years. It can cover about 46 billion light years in 14 billion years. This is what we call our cosmic horizon. It's an information bubble. Remember the fish? Remember the fish? It's the information bubble within where we live in the universe. Now, if you ask me, okay, what's outside of this information bubble? I would say probably more universe because everything that we know now points towards a flat universe, which is another thing we can never know absolutely for sure it's the case. We can say everything indicates that that's the case, right? But we cannot know for certain what's outside that information bubble. And there are all sorts of questions that come out from there. For example, people that defend the notion that our universe is not unique, but it's part of a multiverse and that there are other universes out there. It is a very complicated thing to in, in validate empirically because we live in a cosmic horizon. So whatever is out there, another universe is not directly observable through a, 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 like a galaxy is, and it's going to be only indirectly inferred and when it's something is indirectly inferred, you have to make sure that the explanation that you have is the only viable explanation. And that is very difficult. So what you have is finally a battle between, in philosophy, you would call ontology versus epistemology. So the ontologists would say that there is a fundamental substrate of the world and that what we have with science is this fundamental substrate. The epistemologists would say, wait a second, the only way we look, we can know the world is by looking at the world and the way we look at the world is fundamentally limited by our, our rational reach and by the reach of our instruments. And hence, there is no way we can know what is the fundamental ontology of the world. All you can do is construct better and better pictures as time goes by. So I am, 
of the team of the epistemologists. That even if there is something at the very fundamental level, we'll never know what it is. You can get closer, but then you never know if you're close enough to close the case, so to speak, because how do you know you've seen everything, right? And this affects all sorts of current speculations in different branches of physics from, from cosmology and multiverse to particle physics that we could talk for a very long time, but I already talked for a very long time. And I think I should stop now and open for questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Marcelo, for your great talk. Um, we have plenty of questions in the Q&A and I see many of our panelists have also raised their hands. Um, but again, as uh, the host, I will take the privilege of asking you the first question. And um, this goes towards um, the, the 25-year-old German Austrian that in 31 basically revolutionized our understanding of how knowledge creation can be done in a framework of, let's say, um, axioms, right? Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Mm -hmm. And so Gödel um, says that, right, in a, in, a, in a trustworthy set of rules or axioms, right, you can create some framework of deductive reasoning that the statements that you produce mm -hmm. out of these axioms can be valid, validated or falsified. Right? That in itself is quite remarkable because it sets up a framework that goes beyond the applicability of these of these rule sets right so there is something that we i don't know intuition you want to call this um understand our our brain is capable of sort of venturing beyond the rule set understanding that there are limitations that by itself i think is remarkable and so my question is is Gödel's um incompleteness theorem realized already in our understanding let's say of the quantum world where you have the difference between right the, the the quantum world is a probabilistic set of of um, let's say observables right we understand them in a in a larger context as an ensemble reality so to speak but the individual particle right we 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 just don't have access to this determinism so does the universe somehow i don't know apply a censorship um based on sort of the idea of Godelian, let's say, censorship, and even worse. I mean, if you think about Bell inequalities, then it's not even, you cannot look at the individual, but it's not even local, right? So everything sort of falls apart. So is Gödel's idea already implemented in the universe? Okay, so um, that's a great question. And um, I would say that they're different things. Um, the, yes, there is incompleteness in mathematics and the two theorems that Gödel proved, basically, as you said very well, said that if you have a set of rules, which is to, supposed to be closed upon itself, you can still ask questions within that little universe that you created that cannot be proved with the tools that you have at your disposal. So that means that you can create a perfectly well-defined and, 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 and set up a mathematical universe that has within it questions that are unanswerable, right? And, um, and so that's, and that was a blow against um, Bertram Russell and Whitehead's uh, project of constructing a completely axiom axiomatic uh, mathematics that would have a complete closure upon itself. So what he's saying is that there is no logical system that is closed upon itself. And, and you have to, and that the question then becomes, and I do not know the answer to that question, and I don't think really anybody does, uh, depends who you talk to, um, is that is that because there is something universal about this incompleteness of mathematics? Or is this something that is telling something about how we humans think and how we humans create logic and semantic rules to describe our thoughts. Um, and that's a very big question. You know, I think the difference between that and, uh, and quantum physics is that if you take quantum physics at face value, 
right? And Anton Zeilinger, who is one of the great magicians of laboratory experiments that blow your mind with quantum physics, um, he wrote a beautiful book called, I think, The Dance of the Photons, where he says that everything that we have learned so far about quantum physics basically speaks to a fundamental indeterminacy of nature at a very fundamental level, which is what you're saying, that somehow matter brings out some indeterminacy. And that is independent on, of the logical systems that we use to describe physics. So I, so I think, yes, I think there is some fundamental indeterminacy in the material universe, but I would not think that it is the same kind of incompleteness that we have in mathematics, although in my book, I talk about them both as examples of limits of knowledge and limits of, of the reach of thinking, you know. So it's a, it's a good thing to think about, but yeah, no locality, let's not go there yet, because I'm sure there are too many questions to, to discuss. Okay, I think um, Julio uh, wanted to go next. Okay, so thanks, uh, Marcelo. I hope you can hear me. And um, my question goes, you know, kind of siding with your epistemological view of, uh, of you know, our, our enterprise that we call science and recognizing the societal and cultural backgrounds that guide what we consider, you know, scientific knowledge. And in particular, you know, looking at history and realizing that what we consider to be true or demonstrated has of course evolved over the years. I mean, the Greeks, for example, distrusted mathematics and they believed that everything was had to be, I don't know, geometric in, and pure in its understanding. Otherwise you wouldn't understand that it was just a kind of a lesser, a lesser way of thinking about, about, uh, about nature. And of course it provides a not only in, in a construct of you know what we believe to be true or demonstrated or understood, but also provides us with a set of you know hidden assumptions and or obvious premises that have also plagued us over the years, or over the centuries, I guess. That the idea at the time was you know unchangeable, for example, the idea that a trajectory had to be perfectly understood, you know, clearly would know those things not to be true for relativity. And in the quantum world, at least we know we cannot trace, you know, the, the trajectory of a of an electron, say, like we trace a trajectory of a of a baseball. So, what I mean with that background, what do you think are the hidden assumptions or obvious premises that today underlie our you know enterprise of physical knowledge? I guess that may be obstructing us from seeing better or from you know going beyond. I'll give you just a couple of things that I've thought personally, not necessarily how you have to subscribe to any of them, but uh, just to clarify what I'm thinking of. For example, the idea that physical laws must be written in some kind of mathematical nature, and that the mathematical nature has, you know, an intrinsic value to it. The idea of causality, that things have to, you know, cause and effect have to be always, you know, in a particular order, and it cannot be reversed. The idea of, you know, very fundamental conservation principles, like, you know, say, charge parity, time, symmetries that cannot be changed. You know, what are these axioms, which one, or, or maybe others that you can think of, of course, yourself, which of these axioms are the most restricted, restrictive in the sense of you know, how we uh, understand reality uh, today? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a wonderful question. And I'm actually writing a book with a philosopher and another astrophysicist called Adam Frank, uh, which we call the blind spot. Okay, and the reason why it's called the blind spot, it's exactly for what you're saying. And the notion that the way we do science, which is wonderful, magnificent, nobody's putting science down here. You know, I'm like the card carrying, super hooray to science, but we have to be honest about how science is done. And one of the fundamental things that science has done, and I think it speaks to what your examples are, is this notion of detachment. You know the, that that there is a detachment between us and and nature. That experience is not important, right? Everything that we've done, right? I mean, we we tell this to our students: do not pay attention to experience, right? The way we sense reality, the way we think about things, is not the way a scientist thinks about things, right? And there is a famous 
conversation between Einstein and Henri Bergson, the philosopher, about the nature of time, where in 1922, this was a big deal because at that time, Bergson was a superhero, much more famous than Einstein was. And, I, and Bergson is saying, you know, you guys can quantify time into these little, very nice intervals, but that has nothing to do with my, the way I experience time as a person. I mean, time for me can flow faster and slower depending how I'm feeling, my emotions. So how can science claim to give a complete description of reality if our very human experience is not included in it? And the answer that we give, that, I, that we have been told and that we give, which is true, is that science is trying to reach a sort of universal narrative, right? The independence of subjective ways of thinking about things. You know, the whole point is that it doesn't matter who you are, where you live, etc. If you apply Newton's law, you can calculate how long is it going to take for a little ball of Galileo's free fall, for a little ball to fall down. It doesn't matter. All you need to know is, is what gravitational field you're in, etc. So there is that. But I think that many of the questions that we are asking right now about science, which are really getting closer to philosophy, you mentioned you mentioned a few of them, like causality. We, you know, causality is the bedrock of physics. I mean, you know, it is essential, right? But then you have this no locality of quantum mechanics that you guys must have, that Thomas talked about where, what is going on there, right? I mean, there is some sort of entity, which is this pair of particles or more than a pair of particles that seem to behave in ways that are oblivious to space and time. Doesn't matter how far, it's, you know, they sort of, and, and what is going on is that a causal, you know, that would horrify Einstein and a bunch of other people. Um, and so there is a big movement perhaps to kind of answer these questions and the same sort of uneasiness that you and I feel, which is this movement that we really need to bring back the observer into quantum physics. That uh, quantum mechanics is very efficient. We all, all know how to, how to apply the rules, you know, and when I teach graduate level quantum mechanics, I am, this is how you do it. It's a famous shut up and calculate thing, right? I mean, this is it, this is how we do it. Shut up, it works. We can calculate the probabilities, et cetera. But there's so much more to it. And, and the, the more to it, the same with dark energy, make points to new ways of thinking about nature that could be revolutionary in principle, you know? So yeah, I think we need to keep an open mind. And you mentioned matter and antimatter anti asymmetry. Boy, I spent the, the, the almost 10 years in the 90s working on this stuff, you know, trying to see if we could figure out if this asymmetry could come from a phase transition in the early universe during the lateral symmetry breaking, right? That was the sort of, and, and then we said, it works beautifully if the Higgs is less than 90 GeVs or 75 GVs, I don't remember. Yeah, but the Higgs is 125. So none of these models work, you know? And so what do you do, right? And, and one thing that I wanted to make clear in case people are even thinking about asking, which is this, this view of limits of knowledge is not defeatist. It's not like, oh, why bother? It's actually quite the opposite. It's a very optimistic way of thinking about things because you realize that you always have new questions to ask because there's no end in sight, you know? But honestly, Julio, I am teaching physics in a very different way now to my students, even my technical physics students than I was 15, 20 years ago because of this way of, of thinking. Beautiful. So let's go to Marina next. Okay. Hi, Marcelo. Thank you for the beautiful talk. Uh, I, I have a, a question that is something that uh, bothers me for a while um, because I think it is worse than uh, we are human beings trying to make sense of what we observe, what we see, we have the tools and uh, it's worse than that because we are to keep doing that, we need grants, we need a position, we need, uh, you know, and uh, I have the feeling that um, if we deviate a little bit from the mainstream or 
or and uh, there is this thing of publish or perish and i think that uh, mainly young researchers we are uh, struggling to 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 keep doing and keep uh, um, doing science but uh, how do you think this way that we are doing science now affects uh, the discovery of things that we don't know because we see we deviate a little bit we don't get to get a position so this question that we asked basically it won't be answered because we don't don't get a how do you i would like to to, to know what you say, what have to say about this yeah that's a very very good and important question actually because you're absolutely right um um the whole system is designed to give grants to low risk questions. I mean, if you, you know, in Brazil and in the United States, if you go to NASA, if you go to the Department of Energy and National Science Foundation, the grants that are given are usually, yes, they're expanding the knowledge, but by small increments, there's not, there's no investment on high risk questions. What is changing, and, and that is, I assume true in Chile as well, you know, what it's changing a little bit, it's giving me a little bit of hope on this, is that at least in the United States, and Julio for sure knows this and Nossan as well, is that um, foundations are beginning to also be extremely important in funding science. And in particular, funding projects that are high risk, possibly low payoff, but if they do, you know, pr probabilistically, you know, if you have, have a very daring question, the probability that you're right is small, but man, if you're right, it's a big, big payoff, right? It's like looking for extraterrestrial intelligence, right? Odds are very tiny, but boy, if you find it, it'll be awesome. So foundations are playing a big role in that. Um, and in Brazil, certainly not yet, uh, but in the United States, definitely. I mean, between the Simons Foundation and the um, Kavli Institutes, which tend to be a little more performa, but still are giving money to people to be a little riskier. And the Templeton Foundation as well, you know, for example, right now they have this gigantic initiative to fund biology questions on is there purpose in life or is life completely random? And, you know, it's a very, it's a question that we all want to, how come a thing that is a network of chemical reactions know it's alive and wants to stay alive. You know, where is that coming from? Is it all biochemistry? That's a, NSF will never fund that, okay? But they are funding that. So it's it's kind of interesting. And and so here's my, my answer. And, and I have a, one funny story since Thomas mentioned non-locality. When I was a grad student in England, I wasn't happy with the research my advisor gave me. So I went to talk to John Bell, the guy, the Bell from Bell Inequality, super famous, physicist from CERN, and I said, can I please work with you on the interpretation of quantum mechanics? And he looked at me and he said, absolutely not. It will ruin your career because that's not the kind of question a young kid would be asking. Even if you're famous, most people will not pay attention to you, right? And that was in the 80s, right? And now the field of interpretation of quantum mechanics is a real big field and it has to do with quantum information theory. So it's changed a bit, but the point being that, yes, the system is designed to form highly specialized technicians, right? And you become a technician in a subfield of a subfield. And if you keep doing that work, it's, it's called the hedgehog and the fox, right? There's the famous comparison between the different kinds of thinkers, right? The hedgehogs and the foxes. And the system is designed to reward many more hedgehogs than foxes, let's put it that way. And it's difficult. So my suggestion is to try to allocate a little bit of your time to the more daring questions, you know, and until you get tenure and then you can do something a little more riskier. That's exactly true. <laughs> okay, let's go to Luz next. Hey, so. Uh, hi, Marcelo. Thank you very much for your very nice talk. Uh, it was very insightful. So I'm wondering about searching for life, extraterrestrial life. So as you said, we are somehow as the, the fish inside the tank and we like, like our vision of reality is permeated by these um, 
notions that we get inside this tank. So do you think that we're doing the best that we can do now to find new forms of life outside uh, the earth? Or we should try to look for different techniques to understand or try to find some signatures of life uh, outside or different than ours? Thanks. That's, a, that's another great question. That could be a whole talk too, because I am at this very moment, I'm writing the chapter on life on the book that I'm writing with this philosopher on the blind spot book. And, and my opening sentence is, we do not know what life is. There is no agreed upon definition of life is. And we do not know how life originated on earth. We really do not know. And in fact, I would even go further and that would upset a lot of people, I think in the field of origin of life, which is, I don't think we can ever be sure of how life originated on earth. Unless you can prove a theorem that shows you that there are only very limited biochemical pathways from non-life to life. Even if you create life in the laboratory, which is, I think, possible, you know, not very hopeful, but it's possible. Um, you cannot know if that was the way life emerged here on Earth for many, 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 many reasons, you know, which, and so that could be an unknowable right there in the in the field of origin of life. But so to answer your question more directly, um, I had an um, event in my institute here with exactly about this called What is Life? I would encourage you to take a look um, because I had a, 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 a geophysicist, very good geophysicist called Bob Hazen and a philosopher called Carol Cleland. And Carol defends the position that you should not even try to defend life, or, excuse me, define life. Because once you define something, you put it in a box. And by putting it in a box, you immediately limit the ways you try to find that thing. So for example, perseverance just landed on Mars. Why did it land where it landed on a crater of an ancient lake that has rivers that flow into it 4 billion years ago? What are they looking for? They are looking for stromatolites. Stromatolites is the stuff you see in Australia, like Sharks Bay, right, in the West, which are basically mats of ancient bacteria, right? So they're looking for life as we know it, which makes some sense because that's the only example we have. But is that dangerous in a sense that will that limit other kinds of life that we have absolutely no idea how to understand yet? Or, or is it so rigid that there's only carbon-based, water-based kind of life in the universe? Could it be um, silicon-based? Could it be ammonia-based in terms of solvents? You know, and, and we don't know. Could the planet be alive as a whole? That's another question that is being asked very seriously by a lot of people. Is the kind of positive and negative feedback loops that occur in the atmosphere and within, be, between the atmosphere and the currents and, and, and pollution, are these things reacting in a way that has some sort of cognitive intelligence to it. So, so people are asking questions like that, not funded by NSF, I have to say, but they are being funded, you know, because people are trying to think of life in different ways. I have a past PhD student who's now as an assistant, no, she's actually tenured, professor at Arizona State. She's a superstar in astrobiology called Sarah Walker. So she'll be a great speaker for this series, by the way. And so Luz, take a look at Sarah Walker and what she's been doing because she very much is interested in exactly that kind of question. Okay, thanks. Perfect, let's go to Margot next. Thank you, Marcello, I, I loved your talk. Uh, continuing on the topic of uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, during your talk, you raised the question, if alien intelligences exist, would they ask the same questions as we do? And I thought it was a really interesting question. So I thought a little bit about, um, well, the way that, of course, our evolution and our constitution would be very different from those aliens, which would, uh, as you say, be reflected in our different worldviews. 
Uh, but then there are also universal properties of the universe which we would share with those aliens. For example, our three space dimensions and one time dimension. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, there would be or could be fundamental questions that these aliens would also ask, uh, which would be, while well, relating to space, the question of their place in the universe and relating to time, uh, of course, the question of beginnings. So where do we come from? And the question of the end, uh, what happens after I die? So relating this to a question, um, well, the, uh, the ultimate unknown for each individual is of course death, uh, what lies beyond the grave. Um, so my question is, do you think that we can ever know if or what we will experience after our physical matter has merged with that of the rest of the universe, so to speak? Uh, can we even experience the moment of our death, especially since, well, as you say in your book, uh, time concepts like the present and passage of time are slowly being revealed as constructs made within our brains <laughs> okay um, <laughs> that's a very very um big question and i have to i have to um confess i'm not an expert on 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 the topic although i've read somewhat on it and every time i give some public lectures especially in brazil brazilians love spiritualism you know they're very very much into that uh, and uh, people ask these questions all the time and i have my answer is i don't know um, you know, I would, in fact, my nine-year-old son asked me this question this morning. I mean, literally, he says, so dad, do you think that we can live again after we die? I mean, he just did this literally this morning. And I'm like, I will give you two answers. First one is, I wish we could. It would be awesome to know that you can come back, especially if you have a memory of your previous life, because if you don't, it doesn't matter, right? If you have no memory, pff, who cares, right? It's like starting all over again. But if you have a memory, you'd have a chance of being a little smarter the second time over, right? And not repeating some of these stupid mistakes that we we make through life. So that could be good. It could also point to an asymptotic improvement of humanity, which doesn't seem to be happening. So there is a one point against the empirical validation <laughs> of this. So I, I don't have any memories of previous lives now. So probably the memory thing uh, <laughs> so that's, will not happen. But, you know, if you talk to a Tibetan Buddhist, um, like the Dalai Lama, and uh, many, many very intelligent people, uh, that follow Tibetan Buddhism. Not, I don't want to talk about Christian soul and that kind of stuff. They really have a whole system of belief based on that, right? So that they do come back. And um, so, but but from a scientific perspective, I, I really don't have anything to say about that. I love the notion that we are made of stardust, that, that the, the atoms that exist in our bodies are probably more than 5 billion years old because the rest of stars that blew up before the sun existed. And all that is really new here is the way they became you. So you are a young agglomeration of very old atoms. And I think that's just a beautiful notion. And essentially, who knows where the atoms that are you now will go next, right? So you may become part of a, a palm tree in the Fiji Islands, or you may be expelled by some impact and <laughs> travel through space, who knows? But the point is that um, I wish I had a more positive and final answer to that, but I don't think no one does, right? And um, at the end of the day, what matters is what we do with the life that we have right now. That's really... Still remarkable that 1.5 kilograms of gray matter can understand the rest of the universe, right? And yeah, so even if it also makes a difference, right? Yeah. Okay, let's go to Nosan next. Yeah, first, first of all, thank you, Michelle. A very interesting talk, and really, I really enjoyed it. Also, uh, in that list of foundations that give money for strange questions or non, uh, I wanted to add in FQXI. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, which good is, point. FQXI. Yes. Which is a very, which is an amazing um, group of people. Um, 
I, I just wanted to comment on Thomas's first question to you, to Marcello. Uh, he asked about uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem and does it have anything to do with um, with the uh, quantum? And Thomas is not the first person to ask this question. This question was asked by John Wheeler. Mm -hmm. And he, I actually spoke to somebody who's in charge of his online archive of, of, of mm -hmm. Wheeler, and he told me he was obsessed with this question. He was mm -hmm. so obsessed with this question that he actually asked Gödel. He asked Gödel, is there any connection between, um, you know, incompleteness and, and unc the uncertainty of, 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 of quantum, uh, quantum mechanics? And Gödel said, no. <laughs> that was the end of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, but um, there is. We, we, <laughs> I think I agree with him then. I'm glad. Whew. You know, I don't want to go against Gettle. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, this was a little earlier and whatever, but there is a certain connection in the following sense. Um, the Gödel's incompleteness theorem is basically formulating a mathematical statement that says, I am unprovable. Mm -hmm. And if it's true, then it's unprovable. So it's a true but unprovable statement. Okay, and it comes from this liar paradox, Epimenides paradox, self-reference, and you have that also in quantum mechanics, as you were talking about the disentangling, you know, the the observer from the observed is a very is a very hard thing to do, you know. So in, in a popular setting, you'd say, you know, is a photon a wave or a particle? Well, it depends on how you measure it. In other words, the the measurer becomes part of the system, and and. Part of the weirdness of quantum mechanics is is this this um, that same type of self-reference that's in there. So, I mean, Gödel is probably right in, in in some sense, but there is this self-reference that that goes in there too. And just to 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 make one push, I mean, computer science and logic, going back to Gödel and Turing, I mean, they're they're the first to deal with this unknowable. I mean, Turing has this whole classification of what is unknown and, and things like that. So um, they've been dealing with these things for, for since the 1930s, literally. And, and, and um, you know, it, it, it would be interesting to push Thomas's question further and, and, and somehow connect physics to, to those questions. But again, thank you for a beautiful talk. No, thank you. And th that's a very good point. And in my book, The Island of Knowledge, I actually do mention Gödel and Turing because I talk about the limits of computation and the fact that, you know, the big questions on computation about incompleteness is, is um, well, there is the, the problem of the stoppage problem, right? That, uh, that uh, Turing uh, came up with, but um, or the halting problem, I think it's called in, in computational physics. But there's also the issue of if you have a computer that is big enough to simulate the universe, you will never simulate itself because it can't be big enough to include itself, right? So there's always a limit to what a material entity can do in terms of, of simulations, right? Which is a little bit like the uh, uh, Jorge Luis Borges story, The Library of Babel, where, you know, it's a library that contains all the books that could be written, have been written, will be written. But the problem is they could not ever have an all-inclusive catalog because that catalog will not include itself as a, in the catalog. And so you need a catalog that will include that catalog. And then you need another catalog that includes that catalog and so on and so forth. And that's exactly how it goes with Gödel's theorem too. You could create a, 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 a wide or bigger logical system that does answer the question, but then you need another one and another one. It's like the Russian dolls kind of thing. There's a self-reference again. And yeah, again. yeah. It's the strange loops that people tend to call it. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. So Demetra, do you have a question from the Q&A? Yes, there is this question from Pablo Garcia who says, do you think we are stuck in this mentality where the future is whatever extrapolation form of the present like middle-aged people thought the future will bring bigger and faster horses, but no airplanes. Do you think we might be in a similar situation with the development of quantum mechanics? Thank you for the beautiful talk, by the way. Thank you, thanks for the question. Um, yes, I think the future has a lot of it that is un unpredictable. If you think about it, nobody designed this pandemic. We knew it could happen, but it happened and it changed 
the world in very profound ways and it's still doing it and it's going to do it for sure. Um, and some of the things that will come out of it, I hope are very beneficial. Uh, I'm an optimist, you know, so I think that uh, we're gonna learn a lot from it, but one of the potential byproducts that, um, that is coming out of this is that the new kinds of vaccines that have been developed are possibly going to revolutionize the way we think about vaccines and the, the kinds of uh, illnesses that we'll be able to deal with. For example, we may very well have an RNA vaccine, so similar to the one that Moderna and Pfizer have developed that will take care of the common code because they're also kind of coronavirus-like. So, so because of the um, unpredictability of the world, because there is so much that we do not know in the present state of, of the earth and of society and of the universe, you do not have enough information. In, in, in physics, we call this a problem of boundary conditions. You know, We do not know how detailed our boundary conditions are in order to predict the behavior of anything with tremendous certainty. So I think there's always room for surprise. And I think the big question for all of us as humans right now is how are we gonna make sure that we can change that surprise into something that is good for the future of this planet, right? That's what to me is the biggest question we have right now. So the future is not written in stone is what we make of it. To use a jar uh, kind of a cliche. On that note, thank you so much. This was a beautiful, beautiful presentation and discussion. Thank you, Marcelo, for your time and for your thoughts. Uh, thanks to the audience for being around and asking great questions in the Q&A. We will forward them to Marcelo. Thanks to the panelists. Uh, excellent uh, contributions and questions and comments. So this was a lot of fun. Um, please be so kind and uh, fill out the survey after the Zoom webinar. And I would like to announce the next golden webinar, which will be on the 26th of February. It will be given by Shep Dolman, who is a Harvard Smithsonian um, astrophysicist at the Center for Astrophysics and the founding director of the Event Horizon Telescope Project. And he will be talking about the Event Horizon Telescope from first images of black holes to real time video. So that's going to be exciting too. Oh, okay. Stay safe, stay healthy. Until the next Golden Webinar Astrophysics. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for having me. Thanks, panelists and everyone. And I'll see you soon.